We hope you enjoyed this teaching from Christchurch Birmingham. More teaching can be found at www.christchurchbirmingham.org. Good morning, church. My name is Gino. I serve on staff at CCB. It's great to be back at the pulpit and the honor to bring God's word this morning. If you have your smartphones, Bibles, or tablets, whichever one, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 6. Today, we're continuing our series through 1 Corinthians. We've called it Connections That Count. Dan and Steve actually allowed me to architect another series, and this is another one. It's a 10-week series. Uh, Thank you for the grace on that. So we call it Connections That Count because we're talking about relationships with one another, with God, whether you're married, whether you're dating, whether you're single, how do we get on generally with one another? So we have our topic today, which is going to be sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, quite a heavy one. It would probably take its own series, to be honest with you guys. It would take its own series to do it justice, but I've got 30 minutes, and I think I'll be able to fit that in 30 minutes. (laughs) Famous last words. So it's not lost on me that culture and society has a posture akin to storming into a pub on match day looking to start a fight, right? Showing up with your kid at the stadium representing your side of this issue looking to start a row. Or you're waiting in the office to file a complaint to HR because someone's played some Christian music you don't quite like. I think somebody knows about that. (laughs) Or you've had a very emotionally volatile conversation that's escalated with a family member to a point where you just cannot see eye to eye and you just have to separate from the conversation. It's heated, but let me assure you, you're not going to find a fight here. That's not our posture. Everyone is welcome here. Those who are seeking, those who are searching, hospitality is very important to CCB. We want people to feel welcome. I often say this, a church is a, not just a place you go to, it's a family to belong to, Amen. right? An extension of that is the desire to build relationships, to sit with people, share a meal, learn their story. So oftentimes I see people walking through that door and they're sort of a closed book. I don't know what's going on in their lives. Behind the stoic expression, the stiff upper lip, what is their story? So picture two chairs, let's say by Lucy and Dan. Cassie, resilient young woman, grew up in council housing to a single mom. She was attractive. She was the hot girl in the group. Had an overactive love life. Her mom was single, had a revolving door of men coming into the house. Didn't know her dad. One of them actually tried to abuse her but thankfully failed. She had her own moral compass. She had her own way of doing things. But two years into uni, she found out some really terrible news. It turns out that mom had an affair with a married man, and she was the result. In her anger, in her lashing out, she wanted to start an OnlyFans to post sensitive material, videos and pictures up there to try and make money, to get out of the economic situation that she was in. Before she got started, she met this guy, friend of a friend. Treated her differently, honorably. It was totally, they they formed a friendship. She developed a crush, found that he was Christian, come to find. For the first time in her life, she was curious about faith, curious about Jesus. Colin, for as long as he can remember, he was same-sex attracted, had a troubled troubled past, grew up in a a broken family, divorced parents, a harsh dad who was religious and clobbered him over the head with the Bible often to a point where they didn't speak for years on end. In his young adult life, he would explore his sexuality, dated men, until one day his mom called and said, hey, dad has cancer and it's terminal. It's terminal. So, in the last-ditch effort to reconcile, through months of hospice, something changed in his dad. His dad was on his own faith journey. He asked, he, 
with tears drenching his eyes, ask for forgiveness for the ways in which he strained their relationship. And the one thing that really stood out to Colin is that he never cursed God, never blamed him for having cancer. And one of the last conversations he ever had with him, Pops encouraged Colin, urged him, find your faith, son. I don't know what your story is. You have no idea what your background is. But our hope is that when you come into this this hall that you will encounter hope, truth, grace, ultimately a person, the loving kindness of a Savior, the tender empathy of Jesus. I often, uh, being here a while, I actually have adopted some British idioms, right? So I say things like, to be honest, to be fair, right? Our prayer is that you'll find a transcendent love beyond measure that's courageous enough to be truthful, to be honest, to be frank. God loves us just the way we are. That's absolutely true. Absolutely. But too much to let us stay that way. Amen? Paul in the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 27, CCB believes this, right? For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. We do not skip anything. All the things that God wants you to know, we are going to preach about it. Sort of a silly example. Steph loved Disney films. Her favorite film is Lion King. And as a as a little girl, she would often skip the part when Mufasa dies. I can understand that. She did this with Bambi, with Dumbo, and other films. There is a forefather in America. I'm a colonial cousin, right? Thomas Jefferson, he was known to actually cut parts of the Bible out. Jesus' divinity, the Trinity, the miracles, most notably the resurrection. Is that what we do with the scriptures? Or do we preach the whole counsel, the full counsel, the full will of God? So we love the parts that speaks about prosperity and good things, but what about finding meaning in suffering? We love that Jesus loves sinners but we never talk about repentance? How often do we talk about repentance? Jesus died for my sins, but the part about God determining what sin is, oh, I don't know if I like that. I was always taught as a young minister to preach with a resignation letter in my pocket, just in case. <laughs> but to add a little bit of levity, levity to this talk, <laughs> this, is the, this is my resignation letter. Lord, please help me. Let's, let's just pray. All right, here we go. Father, we ask that you speak through me with grace, that we can be confident in truth, that it would be communicated lovingly, that you would dismantle and disarm any proud obstacle, any high thing that attempts to exalt itself over and against our knowledge of you. Lord, I'm stepping aside. I've got no strength It's all about you. We pray this in Jesus' name. What is the Christian teaching regarding sex and sexual ethics? Now, if God exists, he created all things, and he revealed design and purpose and intent, we have an opportunity to talk about sex more openly, to have more of an open dialogue about it. Our regions beyond friends in Nepal would like this. We want to have a Himalayan view of sex not the sewer. Himalayan, a high view. There will be a preach on marriage in this series, so look forward to that. As a precursor, sex is a powerful nuclear force. Seriously, nuclear force rightly contained in the context of marriage. A radical giving of yourself in the deepest and most profound way, the most intimate way imaginable, the intermingling of souls. Scripture says, one flesh union between one man and one woman for one lifetime. The world is teaching us something otherwise, something else, influencing, overtly encouraging us to seed ground, to adopt a new view, to deconstruct our faith. You could call it indoctrination. You could call it discipleship. This is what was occurring in the Corinthian church. Now, Corinth, 
bustling cosmopolitan port city located on an isthmus, the map manual, map, sorry. <laughs> there should be a map there. All right. Six kilometers wide, but 200,000 citizens, 500,000 slaves, some estimate. That's densely populated. It would probably take 45 minutes to get from one side to the other. Kind of like Birmingham, <laughs> just traveling 3.7 miles. It's the center of commerce, rich in diversity and culture and religion. A lot of Eastern foreigners who spoke Greek, but those who ran the city spoke Latin. It's like a mini Amsterdam, known for its looseness, sexual immorality. It was like Sin City, Las Vegas. Craig Keener said it this way, Corinth also had a lot of sexual immorality, which was common in port cities. It was said to Corinthianize was said to be an act like a Corinthian sexually. To act like a Corinthian sexually is to Corinthianize. Have you been Corinthianized? What's the answer to that? It, it had been famous for prostitution, but that was dedicated to the god of Aphrodite in the earlier period. That was old Corinth, but new Corinth still had a reputation for immorality, which is found in documents from that period. So, epistles, letters, Paul is writing for a particular situation, addressing a particular problem. It's task-oriented. It's very practical for our faith. That's why the epistles are so important as we're trying to determine what, what is conduct, misconduct sexually, or how to live a, a good Christian life. From chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, we read this. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud." Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit as one who is present with you in this way. I have already passed judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. The first point I want to make, defining sexual immorality. Rendered from the term, the Greek word, porneia. Porneia, that might sound familiar. Porneia. In the context, he's listing porneia alongside adultery and homosexuality, but just to identify each sin individually. But porneia is known to be a catch-all term. It's anything and everything imaginable outside of sex in marriage. Paul is passing judgment upon this man. But the question is begged, what, what standard? By what standard? What standard of morality are you judging this man for? I want you to pay attention to something as we define this. Design and purpose. Hold on to that as we define this. Life, as God intends, procreation was a result of two coming together, right? And then the opposite, sin, which leads to death. It's falling short. The result of the wages of sin is death. Always ends with death. Now, we begin tracing out the elephant in the room. What makes something immoral? What determines the standard? How about, okay, how about society? Sexual morality is defined by society. Interestingly enough, <laughs> what stays in Corinth, or what, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. That was the consensus. But the Romans actually agreed with Christians on this issue of incest. In fact, the Romans had a law where they banished someone that guilty of this crime. Interesting. Paul ends up, of course, saying the same thing. Now, Gino, they're not hurting anyone. They're not harming anyone, right? That sounds very non-judgmental and probably virtuous to many years, right? But we don't all unanimously agree on what harms people, do we? That's the problem. It always assumes a set of moral standards. So if those are shifting, we have to find one that grounds everything. <laughs> I found really funny. Lord of the Rings, if you're a fan. What about self? Do we decide the standard? I often hear the phrase, my truth, my truth. That's kind of a silly parody of the truth. Now imagine living your life with my truth, your truth, playing a board game or a sport where there are fixed rules. How silly would that be? Really? You just moved the goalpost. You just made it easier for yourself. What about driving? 
Here in the UK, our reality is we drive on the left side. That's really odd to me, but we drive on the left side, the steering wheel's on the right. But what if I, just, what if I said, you know what, I'm going to drive on the right side. I'm going to drive 70 in a 30 zone. Why not? In reverse. What about, what about trying to read the side of a prescription, a bottle that says, take two pills every four hours. No, I'm going to take five now, five in five minutes. <laughs> Silly. Dangerous. Grumbling about a test score with a lecturer. I passed with flying colors, I promise. If you see it my way. I, I saw my son Shiloh using a remote control for television as a hammer. Hammering, just going to town. Like, whoa. And it made me think about purpose. I was like, how long until that remote control is unusable? How long until it's wrecked? That's not the purpose of it, right? Society and culture, especially in the West, are defying God's design and purpose for sex. Defiant. So I hear debate often in Christian circles, too. Right? We have debates. Some would say it's more accepting, affirming, more loving to seed ground on this particular issue. But... What about holiness? What happens to holiness? Do we, become, do we become more like the world? Do we now define holiness? If you insist, you're going to overturn 2,000 years of intelligent, serious, God-fearing people who came to the text, historians, theologians, professors, scientists, intelligent people. You didn't have a conservative bend or bias when they came to the text. They were utterly undone and transformed. Whether it's a social contract or individually determined, how we determine righteousness and sin, good and bad, conduct and misconduct, that either it's society or self, or we start with God's word. We start with what he says what his intent, his design, his purpose is. Is he the one in authority, or is it us? Or is it us? There's this long quote from John Mark Homer. He's a minister slash theologian from the Pacific Northwest in America. I won't read the entire thing, but I'll, pay, I'll pull out some lines. I want you to pay attention to the word separated. Okay, here we go. The sexual revolution of the 1960s set in motion a cascade effect, the reversal of the long-standing moral consensus in, around promiscuity, the advent of birth control and the legalization of abortion, the legalization of no-fault divorce, Tinder and hookup culture, the LGBTQI plus revolution, the current transgender wave, the nascent polyamory movement that is actually going on. Amid this revolution, the questions nobody seems to be asking are, is this making us better people? More loving people? Or even happier people? Are we thriving in the way we weren't prior to liberation? Now, point number two. I only really have two points. The third is our response time. Dangers of sexual immorality. Are we merely just imposing our view on others? Or are we warning people of danger? of the damage that can be done when misusing this God-intended gift. Read, let's read chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but, the Lord, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Here, Paul is actually quoting some expressions that circulated, some slogans that circulated around Corinth. This is what they thought. In fact, they had a belief that with greater wisdom attained came greater freedom for anything. Sexual misconduct, anything's fair play. What I do, what I do with my body doesn't really matter was their attitude. This is one of the areas of life that has the most dramatic clash, Greek ethics and the ethics of Jesus. Remember what Jesus says about sexual immorality. He lists it with a whole bunch of other things, right? Speaks about the heart. Chapter 7 of Mark, verse 21. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. 
Jesus cares about the heart. He says elsewhere, from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Corinthians said, I have a right to do anything. We say, our culture says, I have a right to sleep with whoever I want, whenever I want. But not everything is beneficial. Not everything. As we unpack the dangers a bit more, I want us to recall Jesus' posture to the the woman he met and encountered from Samaria at the well, right? If you remember the story, he crossed boundaries of race, of prejudice, he cut through prejudice, religious barriers as well, because Samaria had their own temple where they worship, home center of religious life. But he called out her sin. Remember, she, she came to the well at a very odd time. Nobody was around. She was socially ostracized, outcasted. He cut through that. Think of the wounds she carried from each marriage. He had many marriages and was cohabitating with someone who wasn't her husband. Each, each, marriage had, each failed marriage presented new sets of problems for the subsequent relationship. The grief of trauma, the emotional pain, and the amount of shame she felt eating away at her. Jesus was tender toward her tender, revealing to her he is the Messiah. He can make a difference. He can change things. He can transform. This is the posture we should have when talking about this very sensitive issue. We need to speak to people about Jesus. He's the one who saves. He redeems. He transforms. Now, is there any danger or damage that comes from reducing sex to mere recreational play between adults? Let's take a look at that. Now, Paul calls out the issue of fornication. That's what he refers to when he says porneia, fornication. But this was because of prostitution, which is common in the port cities back in that day, especially in Corinth. Now, in our day, apart from STDs and STIs, which are at least widely acknowledged, no matter what culture or worldview you have, this warning applies to singles and those who are dating, perhaps finding it hard to wait to marriage to have sex. Perhaps you do want to date. Perhaps you want a meaningful, long-term relationship that means something. But if you get involved physically before vetting a person's character, what results? All manner of wounds. Emotional traumas, unhealthy codependencies, like the woman at the well. This reminds me of a song by The Frames. I don't know if you guys know The Frames, an Irish band. Glenn Hansard. Nope? Okay. <laughs> The hook goes like this. And when you want something so much, it's drawing trouble on your life. And when you found something so good, it's hard to focus on what's right. You get caught up. Getting too physical, too fast, you get caught up. You don't even know what's right and wrong anymore. This is what happened to the the man guilty of incest. When I was first walking with the Lord, I found this diagram, this relationship pyramid, very helpful. It's, a guy, it's, it's by a guy called Chip Ingram. Ingram. He's a relationship guru, Christian circles. So notice how the, the bottom foundation is built on spirituality. Having that in common first. And then the physical is the pinnacle. It's the last thing that you should be connecting in marriage. What, the, what does the world do? Flips it upside down. Doesn't it? Perhaps you find it difficult to commit to a long-term relationship. There are some that are like this. The Medical Institute for Sexual Health puts it this way. Something like casual sex doesn't precisely exist. How our brain perceives sex is exactly the same, no matter the duration of the relationship. What happens instead is you train yourself to rewire your brain to believe that, the most, that most relationships are temporary. And when you try to settle down long-term with your subsequent partner, you are more likely to have difficulties trying to adjust and compromise. I'm wondering why I have these wood planks in my my pocket. So sex, becoming one flesh, this radical soul donation, it's like an adhesive glued together. Now having multiple partners back and forth, pulling it apart, adhesive fusing it back together, pulling it apart, fusing it back together, your soul begins to fragment. It begins to shatter into pieces. Say you meet that special person, you don't even feel whole anymore. 
Casual sex affects the production of hormones, bonding hormones, pair bonding hormones, called oxytocin and vasopressin. I want you to, to look this up, please. It decreases the flow of oxytocin and vasopressin. So when you're dating, we tend to ask this, right? How many sexual partners have you had? That's a real question, right? You'd want to know the history of a person, especially the sexual history. Gen Z calls this the body count. Body count. Have you found, though, all, we're so all about liberation and empowerment on both sides in some way, shape, or form. We still lie about that. We don't give the true unadulterated answer. In fact, it renders us into lifelong liars. But what does that do to your soul? You know, you're not fully known by that person. The Corinthians said, I have a right to do anything. Our culture and society says, I have a right to watch porn. I have a right to watch porn. But I will not be mastered by anything. Now, for those struggling with lust, now, Jesus, remember what Jesus said about this. Looking upon a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Again, there it is. Back to the heart. Shifty eyes, reducing women to sexual objects. Where you, where's your gaze going? And failing to acknowledge that this person is a person who's an image bearer of God. I've known many men who battled with porn addiction, some really close to me. And when I look in the mirror, I too did. Before Jesus saved me, that was one of my biggest issues. I couldn't get away from it. I could not free myself. It absolutely mastered me. And it wrecked my relationships. The National Center on Sexual Exploitation describes seamless connection between sex trafficking, prostitution, porn consumption. They're related. This is a serious issue. Addiction is difficult. Now, Marianne Layden is a co-director of, of sexual trauma in the psychopathology program. S says this about pornography. Pornography addicts have a more difficult time recovering from, the, from their addiction than cocaine addicts. What? Since coke users can get the drug out of their system, but pornographic images stay in the brain forever. The Corinthians said, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Our culture says sex is just a biological urge. It's a need. What's the big deal? There is a God of sex in this culture. In Corinth, it was known as Aphrodite or Venus. But there, make no mistake, there is a God of sex. And sex is treated like some type of idol to worship. If I don't have it, if I don't experience it, if I don't have it all the time, I am missing out on something. My life isn't worth living. Is that true? There is this wonderful ministry and resource called Living Out. I'll have it up on the, on the screen later on. They have these great testimonials speaking about the vibrancy of celibacy. Stories of redemption, of transformation, of finding their way. You can experience love in so many ways, not just through sex, not just through romantic relationships. Connections that count, remember. Sexual sin does not just affect the individual, though, right? It could affect a family, your kids, the church. Promiscuity in porn will damage your marriage. Will it not? Damage your children in some way. Is it a stretch to consider that it would damage our church if we're found guilty of it? And it's unconfessed. And it continues to linger. Chapter 5 Verse 4 through 5. So when we are assembled, I am with you in spirit, and the power of the Lord Jesus is present. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. That sounds pretty severe and harsh. But presumably, the, the, the letter of Corinthians was read out loud, and there was a house church, so maybe this man was there listening. Maybe he didn't have to go there. I've known many 
men and women who have been disciplined in the church. They've had a heart of contrition. They want to repent. They want to change. And I've seen amazing stories of transformation, of redemption. Now, handing them over to Satan, it's the realm of the world. That's his realm. The damage, the destruction comes. The dangers are not held back. This should lead that man to repentance if it came down to it. I want to play this clip from a, a group called The Arrows. It's going to be a minute long, but it, the song is called from the words, In the Words of Satan. You have to stop it now. It's going to repeat. It's, all right. All right, so the third point, you have to make a decision of, about sexual immorality. A decision. Chapter 6, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Paul says to flee to, in America, we say, get out of Dodge. Do not go near it. You think you're strong, you think you're strong enough, you're fooling yourself. Don't trifle with something this dangerous, this serious. You're not going to be disciplined enough to handle it. Now, Sexual sin versus other sins. The church has done a poor job elevating sins like homosexuality above, let's say, gossip. They both can eat away at a community, couldn't they? They could affect people. How do we begin to honor God with our bodies? Or for the first time, deciding to honor God with our bodies I think it's to be fully known and to be fully loved. You have to be fully known in order to be fully loved. Tim Keller puts it this way. To be loved but not known is comforting, but superficial. But those who have lied about their body count. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. Rejection. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything anything. Paul says in chapter 6, do you not know that our bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and then unite them with a prostitute? Now, if I stop there, that sounds harsh. It reminds me of an Old Testament prophet called Hosea, himself being a picture of Jesus, a prophetic foreshadowing of who Christ is going to be for God's people. Hosea chapter 1 verse 2, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman, Gomer was her name, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Now God knew that later on, Gomer was going to leave Hosea and go back to living in sexual morality prostitution, to a point where she's owned by someone. What does God tell Hosea to do? Go find her and buy her back. Buy her back. You see, Jesus did that for us. He looked upon our blemishes, our sexual immorality, all of our wounds, the effects of our addiction, the damage, the destruction that's been caused all the shame and the guilt. I want you. I'll pay the price. I'll pay whatever it takes to have you. Those who are feeling unlovable, who can never find themselves in whatever ideal romantic relationship or otherwise. I want you. But Jesus, do you know what I've done? I don't care. I love you. But what if I fail again? What if I fall? What if I surf too long and one too many clicks? I'll still be here. He paid the price to reconcile us, to be there for us, to be our very ability to live a new life. True freedom. Being able to honor God with our bodies. I'm going to call the worship band up and want to respond in prayer, if we can just turn the lights down. I want to give us a space, a private moment. Close our eyes.
Let's pray. Father, this is a time for confession. This is a time for chains to be broken, for addictions to be completely done away with. This is a time to honor you with our bodies, to explore what that means, to run freely in this space that you've created by your death on the cross, this space of freedom. It's like an open field. It's true liberation. God, I pray that you heal, that you restore. For, for those of us wondering, could this be true? This kind of love, a, a, tr- a love I've never known about, not to this extent, a love that redeems, that forgives, that cleanses, that purifies, that transforms us deeply. Lord, have your way. Do your work.